Okay, well, thank you for showing up bright and early for Frontiers in Electromagnetic Methods. Um, so, um, without further ado, because Adam's rather twitchy about being able to race off to give another talk somewhere else, um, I'll introduce our first talk. Paul Bedrosian is going to talk about uh, crustal inheritance and arc magnetism. All right, thank you very much, and uh, again, for letting me be your wake-up call of the morning. Um, is there a pointer? Here we are. Okay, let's see if I can not shine this in somebody's eyes. Um, yeah, so this is a work that is um, part of the IMUSH project. This is a uh, project that involves passive and active seismic, as well as petrologic investigations and magnetotelluric investigations of the magmatic system beneath Mount St. Helens and sort of the, that greater segment of the Cascades arc. Uh, just, it's a collaborative effort uh, here, myself and Jared Peacock, USGS, Esteban and Adam from Oregon State, and Graham Hill uh, from University of Canterbury, who actually did some of the uh, very initial work looking at, um, okay, right button, Mount St. Helens. Um, so there's a, a few motivators for this. Uh, first is the uh, anomalous fork location of Mount St. Helens and Mount Rainier. In comparison to the main arc, which is kind of, um, again, push the right button. Uh, shown by the dashed line here, uh, St. Helens and uh, Rainier are somewhat off the arc axis. And um, this has some, uh, led to some interesting questions as to how is Mount St. Helens actually being fed uh, by what we are sort of traditional um, mantle-derived flux melts. So uh, we're interested in that. Um, additionally, Mount St. Helens has a somewhat unique petrology for an arc environment. It uh, is the most active volcano in the Cascades Arc, and it erupts frequent uh, small volume dacitic uh, eruptions, in contrast to kind of the more traditional andesites that you have along the main arc. And uh, the petrology that we have is telling us that the dacites are actually coming from deep in the crust, from probably a, uh, a mush zone with a small degree of interconnected melt that's fed by sort of wet basalts that then evolve uh, in the deep crust and then make their way up the system. Uh, we also know that it's uh, a little bit more complicated than that. Mount St. Helens has erupted basalts. In particular, it has three different flavors of basalts that have popped up at various points, suggesting you actually have multiple pathways for melt ascent. And uh, there's also, there is an upper crustal magmatic uh, system, which is, we think, is sort of home to short-lived storage for some of these paths. And finally, um, we are hoping to shed some light on the SWCC. This is a crustal conductor that was identified um, initially back in the uh, 80s, actually, by John Booker and others, and has been refined and interpreted in various ways. Uh, and the top here is uh, one interpretation which suggests that the SWCC is actually associated with sedimentary material that is uh, sort of wedged between, sutured between Siletz terrain on the west and Mesozoic North American margin. Uh, more recently, uh, Graham Hill's interpretation was that this zone is actually, the, the SWCC is primarily due to a lower crustal uh, melt system that may be, you know, feeding in this sort of image multiple volcanic systems. So we hope to shed some light on that. So without further ado, um, this is the situation sort of prior to uh, the IMOSH experiment in terms of MT. We had the CAFE line running up here, uh, focused sort of around Mount Rainier. This is Graham's array in red. <coughs> excuse me, um, focused around Mount St. Helens, and a smattering of widely spaced sites around that area. Um, so this is what we added on, approximately 150 stations, and we have sort of now a very nice uniform coverage of pretty much the known extent of the SWCC. So I'm not gonna focus on the inversion itself, um, but I will just make a couple quick notes. Uh, we are using the uh, MODIM inversion uh, developed by Gary Egbert and others, um, and we're using a sequential inversion approach in which we are basically starting with an inversion of just the impedance data, which is sort of this first panel here at a couple of depths, and that gets progressively fed into an inversion of the tipper data, which refines several structural features, and then ultimately to an inversion of both tipper and impedance data. And along the way, we're kind of slowly cranking down our error floors as well as uh, adjusting our model covariance, so progressively fitting the data tighter. And just to convince you that the model I'm gonna show you uh, is actually worth your time, um, this is uh, looking at data misfit as a function of site, as a function of period, and based on the different components we're looking at, and uh, blue is, uh, I think, impedance, and green is tipper. So we have a relatively white fit. There's, of course, a few exceptions always on the sites. 
So let's dive in, uh, looking at resistivity here in the upper crust. Uh, so we're at three kilometers depth. Our color scale here is very broad. We're going from a tenth of an ohmmeter down here to 10,000 ohmmeters up here. And what lights up initially is this very linear feature that's to the west of Mount Rainier here and a series of other sort of very intense conductors kind of surrounding it. And if I highlight a couple things here, in black are the outline of Eocene sedimentary rocks. So these are actually marine to transitional marine carbonaceous shales uh, that are exposed in a series of regional anticlines, very tightly folded and steeply dipping anticlines. So this comes to our, brings us to our first conclusion, which is that within the upper crust, the high conductivity is predominantly associated with these uh, marine shales. And uh, we'll investigate that, see that a little bit further. But there's a good correlation in a number of locations here, here, and here, and along here. Additionally, what is outlined in white are Miocene intrusive rocks. There was a significant pulse of uh, plutonism in uh, the Miocene. And this, for example, is the Spirit Lake Pluton, Tatouche Pluton around Mount Rainier, and several others. And these seem to correlate with our strong resistive units. So um, we're kind of getting this sort of picture of intrusive rocks with uh, sort of sediments or metasedimentary rocks surrounding kind of that area. That picture is much more compelling when you look a little deeper. This is probably one of the more striking images I've, I've certainly produced where uh, you have a nice resistive creamy center and a ring of conductive material surrounding it. So what does this mean? So I'm going to cut to the chase and say that the portion of this over here correlates with the spirit like Pluton. We're arguing that the spirit like Pluton is not just a Pluton, but a larger Plutonic complex, what we're calling the spirit like Batholith, of comparable size and similar age to things like the Snoqualmie Batholith to the north. So um, we're arguing we have this large batholith and that the conductivity which is surrounding it is actually due to a combination of metallic sulfides and graphite. So we have, remember, carbonaceous marine shales and part of the pluton has been noted as having an unusually large contact metamorphic zone up to four kilometers wide with locally amphibolite grade facies. So it's quite possible that th that's high enough metamorphic grade to actually turn some of that carbon into graphite. Additionally, we have had mineralization, uh, sort of up in this area, sulfide mineralization, which uh, pushes a lot of fluids through the crust and may have deposited metallic sulfides as well. So we've got our large batholith, and we have our ring of uh, high conductivity surrounding it. A couple other things to point out is two of the predominant seismic zones, the Mount St. Helens seismic zone and the West Rainier oh. seismic zone, fall right along these conductive belts, suggesting a degree of tectonic control for these features. They're controlling the deformation and seismicity. And additionally, if we look at the quaternary vents, we can see, so in pink here, these are uh, basalt to basalt andesite vents, which predominantly are along the main arc and sort of wrap around this batholith. And there's a small number of dacitic vents which fall right on top of these conductive belts. So we have them right here. There's actually one right up here. There's one that comes out of uh, Mount Rainier, actually. So there seems to be a compositional control as well that uh, this structure is having. Um, on what's, uh, what's happening here. Um, and then most importantly is that there is a relative uh, sparsity of both vents and deformation within this batholith. So it seems like the batholith is also playing a primary role in kind of how we have uh, uh, melts ascending through the crust. And just to, um, I guess I can't go back and forth with this, but uh, this is magnetic potential data and we see that there's this kind of uh, little welt here in the magnetic potential data. And if we flip back and forth for just a second, you'll see that there's a nice correspondence between the locations of those two. So this is all holding together. The magnetic potential data is consistent with sort of moderate susceptibilities that you might expect for sort of granite, granite diorite batholith. Okay, um, so uh, moving onwards. Um, um, the other thing I'll just point out is there are deep long period earthquakes which have been attributed to fluid or melt transport in the deep crust and they also fall near Rainier right along the conductive belt and near Mount St. Helens also on that uh, conductive belt. So um, lower crustal story, um, uh, to cut to the chase, we have a conductive band which is right beneath the arc and we are similar to Graham Hill's work interpreting this in terms of uh, um, a lower crustal mush zone with a small degree of partial interconnected partial melt. 
and it's pretty much wedged between the resistive uh, Slutz fore arc and the resistive Mesozoic back arc. And we're gonna look at this, whoops, in a little bit more detail. I'll just briefly uh, touch upon conductance. So this is the integrated conductivity of the crust. If you look at that for the whole crustal column, you get this rather complex picture, but the important point is it's separable. If you look at the upper crust, you pick out the conductive metasedimentary belts in the ring. If you look at the lower crust, you pick out sort of this elongated zone of partial melt. And I should note that the long strike variability here is artificial. That's simply due to the screening of the high upper crustal conductivity. Um, so these are very distinct conductors. Um, and then uh, just to do a quick uh, look at this, in order to actually convert these bulk conductivities into a melt fraction, we need to be pretty confident in what the conductivity is. So what I've done here is uh, just a, a forward modeling study where we're going to take the lower crustal conductivity and modify it and look at how our data misfit uh, reacts to that. So if the lower crust is 10 ohmmeters, uh, this is our relative change in misfit. The, the whiter those dots get, the more the data scream as uh, you try to fit them. And uh, you can see as we reduce it at 2 ohm meters, 1 ohm meters, there's a uh, significant misfit at you know, a large number of the sites in the area. You can go the other way as well, starting going more resistive. And again, as you get too resistive, the data start to scream. So ultimately, the lower crust here is consistent uh, with it's, it's basically 5 to 15 ohmmeters, and if we put that together with our petrologic constraints, we're looking at on the order of 3 to 10 percent of uh, dacitic melt within a lower crustal mush zone. So um, <clears throat> putting it all together, we have a picture kind of like this, where we have our uh, sort of our very heterogeneous uh, upper crust, which is serving as what I'll call a magmatic filter, uh, which is taking our uh, partial melts within the lower crust and uh, which is relatively uniform along the arc and giving rise to the very heterogeneous distribution of uh, seismicity, of vents, um, et cetera. And also, I would argue, having a control on the composition as well. Um, just uh, a little bit of a side point, we can compare sort of our 3D model to Graham's previous work, which was based on uh, in 2D. And um, you see a very similar picture. There's not a lot of differences, however, the Spirit Lake Batholith is a much more coherent body in 3D, and probably one of the larger um, uh, downsides of kind of pounding a 3D data set into a, into a 2D hole is that uh, there's this inferred sort of conductivity here between the upper and lower crustal conductivity, which goes away when we kind of look at that in 3D. There presumably is conductivity between these zones. Uh, however, we'd argue that it's episodic or ephemeral and that you, you know, in general, don't have sort of continuous melt transport uh, between them. Um, so uh, I'll kind of finish off with this. This is just a movie uh, to take you through the, um, through the model. We have the conductive ring in the near surface, and here's the lower crustal conductor beneath um, the Spirit Lake Batholith, and part of it also beneath the Tatouche Pluton. And as we rotate around here, the, the resistors in blue here are, are the plutons, and they're going to start growing a little bit. And so that's the Spud Mount pluton. Spirit Lake pluton is nestled nicely inside of the, the conductive ring here. And we have our seismicity kind of along the different zones. So to, um, whoops, how do I get to the conclusion? There we are. OK, so to finish off, um, Kind of these are maybe more of the observational points that we have uh, identified this batholith for the first time. We have this upper crustal conductor due to metasedimentary belts, a lower crustal conductor consistent with a small degree of partial melt. And the important part, I think, is that this really is highlighting the role that the crust plays in uh, serving as sort of a magmatic filter and impacting both the distribution and composition of melts. And I'll just note at the end that in arc environments, day sites are relatively sparse. And mostly where you do find them, they're in sort of large caldera forming systems, very long lived systems. So the fact that we are getting sort of thick, viscous day site to the surface in small batches is somewhat unique. And I'll just throw out the idea that it's possible that you really need these crustal controls, sort of permeable zones, mechanically weak zones, which allow uh, these viscous magmas, which would probably otherwise stall in the crust and just turn into a granite diorite to, to erupt at the surface. Thank you. Okay, um, 
Paul's used his 15 minutes, and so um, I'm going to introduce the next talk, um, Controls on Magmatic and Hydrothermal Processes at Yellowstone, um, given by our very own, very own Adam Schultz. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks to uh, many people involved in this project. There's a, a massive field crew involving uh, many institutions. The uh, project was a joint uh, was a collaborative project by University of Wisconsin-Madison and Oregon State University. Uh, what we're being motivated by is really better to understand the details of shallow magmatic and hydrothermal fluid distributions and how they relate to deeper structures, uh, the crust and mantle sources for magmatism beneath the supervolcano. Uh, what already existed, of course, is the Earthscope Transportable MT Array. It passed through there quite a few years ago and a number of papers have been published looking at the, uh, the broader scale structures. Uh, and we are now filling in by combining MT, new MT data and inversion with inversion of existing seismic data jointly. Now, I'm not going to talk about the seismic component of the project at all at this point. And this is a very preliminary first look. The field program basically just recently ended, and we just crunched through the uh, signal analysis component of this. But what we accomplished was installation uh, this summer of 45 wideband MT stations inside and directly surrounding a Yellowstone caldera with station spacing between about 7 and 18 uh, kilometers. Uh, this is sort of previous knowledge, and many of you will have uh, seen these papers over the years. There's this, uh, on the left, a broad scale view along, uh, starting with the subduction zone, the Cascadia subduction zone to the west, and then migrating along to the base of the Snake River Plain uh, in Idaho, where there's this marked conductor uh, hugging the base of the crust that then shallows uh, and surfaces pretty much almost uh, under the Yellowstone caldera. Um, and on the right, uh, that was in the Mechbal et al. paper, and right, uh, the Kelbert et al. paper, showing a cross section, uh, again, using the long period uh, Earthscope MT data primarily, going from the northeast, where this is Yellowstone caldera, going to the southwest, that's what this section is, with uh, underneath the caldera just to the west of it, southwest of it, and deepening toward the Snake River Plain. And this profile kind of bobs in and out of the Snake River Plain, but it's roughly uh, parallel to it. So that was sort of the prior knowledge. Uh, here's the station uh, uh, distribution. So the red dots are the stations we installed uh, this summer. Uh, these, uh, this is the outline of the present-day Yellowstone caldera. Um, and these were um, the uh, Zongzen RX-6 systems with uh, wideband uh, induction coils as our basic instrument. Now, we had to do some novel things. Um, for permitting requirements, in order to get a good station distribution, we didn't want to be restricted only to where the Park Service wanted to put us, which is in borrow pits. It didn't lead to a very good station distribution. So doing conventional MT installations, we were limited to those locations. We uh, got an agreement that we could go into the back country and have a good station distribution if at about half our sites we did no ground disturbance. So we had to come up with a way of doing MT that did not involve building, uh, digging holes, basically. So this is what we came up with. We tested it at Newberry Volcano in Oregon. It worked, so we, we deployed it at Newberry. In the lab, it shows the setup more clearly. We have three, uh, these are uh, ANT-4 induction coils with a rigid non-magnetic clamping system that we built. You clamp them at the midpoint. Uh, we then use a laser to align one of these with north. Uh, here's a field installation. Um, and if it's going to be windy, we put these in a non-magnetic tent. Um, and then we also have a, a system for installing electrodes on top of the ground without having to bury them. And that actually worked quite well. So it's becoming possibly our standard way of doing MT because it frees us permitting restrictions in most cases. Uh, I'm not going to describe this at all. This is purely an advertisement. We had a uh, couple of uh, students from other universities uh, join us this summer as part of the REU program. And they're actually in the audience. And they're going to be giving a poster presentation this afternoon. Uh, so they got a, an initial pass through the data. This is single station process, not remote reference process data uh, that they can t uh, tell you about. There was a southern profile that uh, uh, was done by uh, Rebecca Garola, and she's here. And there was a northern profile, uh, Bryce Neal, who's going to discuss that during the poster as well. Uh, one of the uh, issues of the, the 2D, of course, this is a 3D data set, so you always have those compromises. But actually, they were able to tease out quite a lot of fine-scale structure of great interest. That's not going to be the theme of the initial pass in the 3D inversion. We're just trying to look at the gross features right now to get some idea of data quality. So for the 3D inversion, we've used ModEM as well. 
Uh, we've inverted both the impedance and tipper. We've used uh, 36 Earth scope long period stations and in the traditional frequency band going to past 10,000 seconds period. And what we did is uh, we carried out MODIM inversion of just long period, got a prior model out of that, and then we inverted uh, the wideband MT stations. Uh, and they, they basically produce data in, in this band from near, um, um, it, you know, basically there were six, six decades of, of data available from uh, near uh, microhertz to mega, uh, kilohertz, uh, sorry, millihertz to kilohertz, so we, we, we were using that band. Um, we actually did a whole bunch of different inversions, but I'll just show you that one. We, we divided the uh, model domain into 135 by 135 by 72 cells. Our cell size is one and a half kilometers in the two horizontal dimensions, and it starts with 70 kilometer, 70 meter wide, uh, a thick uh, top surface layer that deepens and, and, and you know, broadens with depth. Um, what else do I want to say about that? Oh yeah, and as Paul, Paul did, played around with various smoothing parameters, and I won't belabor that. The model I'm going to show you now, uh, fit is not great. It's very initial. Uh, we're getting a misfit, an RMS about 12 in this one. But let me just go you, uh, take you through various depth sections. This is the boundary of the uh, Yellowstone National Park. This is the present day caldera and some of the older caldera centers. And we're going to start right at the surface. We're in the kind of surface galvanic scattering layer. And then going down. Keep in mind our station spacing is such that we're not going to get broad scale coherent, spatially coherent structures until we get down to depths something more like this. But already you're noticing uh, there's kind of a conductive zone that's appearing right at the edge of the caldera to the, uh, the north here, northeast, and there's something else going on along the edge of the caldera here. And as we go, go to greater depths, these structures tease out more and more clearly. And then uh, over here by uh, Sour Creek Dome, its center is moved to near the, the edge of the dome, and now they begin to merge at depth. And as we get down into mid-crust, it persists, heads somewhat to the center of the caldera. We're picking up some conductance here at the edge. This particular inversion I'm showing you does not include the long period data. That's just used the, the long period data from the NIMS uh, work is used to generate the prior model. And this is just the wide band inversion. When I use both data sets, uh, this feature gets a little clearer. And that's the uh, high conductance that um, we see along the Snake River Plain eventually. OK. And uh, just showing you the idea of the whiteness of the misfit. This is the RMS misfit for the four impedance tensor elements, ZXX, ZYY, ZYX, ZYY. So this is showing RMS misfit. The size of the circles indicates the magnitude of the misfit and the color indicates whether we're under or overfitting high or low frequencies. So it's giving us an initial uh, indication of uh, areas we may want to refine the grid in in particular in order to tease out some more, more information and reduce the color and size of the misfits. Uh, here's a uh, west-east section slice through, here's a map view at 10 kilometers depth. This latitude goes through, if you're familiar with the park, goes through Madison Junction, which is kind of our almost model center. It's, it's close to the center of this conductive feature, which is in the northeast of the Caldera Rim. And this is the vertical section through that. So it's quite robust. Uh, I should mention that when we do the various inversions of di different combinations of data sets, as you would expect, the wideband data is really teasing out information in, in the upper roughly nine kilometers. And uh, below about 15 kilometers, really what's dominating it is the long period transportable array data. And in between, they're both contributing significantly. Various uh, volume renderings of this feature. Uh, I'm showing ISO surfaces uh, of one in the, in the densest part, uh, three and 10 ohmmeters. Uh, so here we're looking at a map view from the south to the north. Uh, this, this particular surface is three kilometers down, and then there's that volume rendering of, of this ISO, set of ISO surfaces with our two shallowing conductive features along the edge of the caldera rim. And looking at it straight on uh, in vertical section or straight down vertically. So again, these are very robust features in the data. And you see this deeper feature, and then there's the shallow stuff that the wideband data is really beginning to tease out. And you know, the inclination is to think of this being a source of the partial melt that's feeding the volcanic system. And then much of what's going on near the surface in the upper three, four kilometers is likely hydrothermal alteration and active hydrothermal. 
Uh, oh, there, inevitably, even though this is super preliminary, these models are going to be refined a great deal in the coming months, and then, then uh, we'll be staring and comparing with new seismic results. But let's stare and compare this initial crude pass at existing seismic models. On the right, we're looking at a uh, depth map of a P, P anomaly, P wave anomaly from Huang et al. in uh, 2005, uh, and our, our model at two kilometers depth. And we see this high uh, conductivity zone in this part of the, uh, of the caldera rim, which is sitting about midway between these slow zones in the uh, seismic anomaly. And then we have a conductor here at the edge uh, where it's transitioning from a, a, fast, a, a slow to a fast zone. Uh, going down to four kilometers, um, again, we still have our two zones of higher conductivity, and we've got this slow zone in between them. We also have something going on to the south. Going to eight kilometers, we're beginning to, to merge together. The seismic slow zone is beginning to fill the cald caldera uh, footprint, and at 14 kilometers. So an interesting kind of staring and comparing. The last staring and compare I'll do is with um, INSAR ground deformation. We see uh, bulging happening to the northeast of the caldera. Uh, this was about a decade ago. And uh, we see our prominent conductor at the edge of uh, the, the prominent dome between the dome and the caldera rim. This is also a map of seismicity in the north part of Yellowstone Lake, which is just about here at the edge of this. So to conclude, super preliminary pass through the data. We have successfully acquired 45 wideband uh, stations about 43 of them are really quite high quality, and we've used those in the uh, 3D inversion. We're still fiddling around with two of them to try to extract some, some more data out of the noise. We had to deal with issues of uh, very low signal level, particularly in the long period dead band, where we had coherent noise due to ocean microseisms, even out in Yellowstone, which is quite interesting. We also had lo local lightning effects we had to deal with uh, near the fundamental of the Schumann resonances. Uh, we have robust features already appearing from the initial 3D uh, inversions, and it looks like we have a strong plume form conductive feature originating in the lower crust, shallowing under the north and east rim of the caldera, and there is some association with P-way anomalies and with ground deformation. And, you know, the, the speculation at this point is pretty obvious, a partial melt source and surface hydrothermal alteration and hydrothermal features. So I'll leave it at that and run to another meeting very shortly. Do you want to take questions? I can take a Question yeah, okay, we've got time for a couple of questions, if there are any. Oops. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. So, um, you, you teased us by saying that we might be able to meet our shuttles with um, the sort of temporary equipment. Could you, um, could you comment on some of the data that you showed? Is it responsive? Were all the stations about this on the surface, or were some of them actually buried? About half were buried and half were on the surface, and there's no the only difference in data quality that was in any way systematic is a small drop in signal to noise level that affected the long period dead band, but uh, re remote referencing always seemed to clean that, that up. So it was a very small number of dB drop. Uh, what can really clobber you is wind noise. So if you don't use a, a tent over it and in, in a windy area, you're not going to get good quality data. So that's the only thing that you have to worry about. Uh, the electrodes are very easy to do. We, we put burlap bags filled with wet bentonite. Wet, we wetted the, the ground, plopped those bags with the electrodes in them, covered them with a plastic top and a, a tarp. And actually, that really worked quite well. So there were no other special precautions needed. We got a waiver of, ha of permitting requirements going forward for the area around Newberry Volcano using this method. So we were actually able to get back into the National Volcanic Monument for the first time, because that had been closed using this method. So I think if you're worried about doing permitting related issues, this really helps. Okay, thanks Adam. Okay, we'll let Adam race away. Um, the next talk is um, Evolving 3D, um, sorry. Yes, okay, the, the, the title on the slide and the title I have is different, so, uh, but most importantly it's going to be given by Kate Robinson. Hi everyone, so today I'm going to be showing you the latest results and insights that we've gained from the Auslamp MT data set across South Australia. So my name's Kate Robertson, I'll be presenting on behalf of Stefan Thiel, who unfortunately couldn't make it today.
So before I jump into the data, I just thought I'd give a bit of background about the types of processes and features we'd like to be able to image with the OSLAMP data set, as it is a very deep sounding, low resolution type um, project that we're doing. So this figure is showing the P wave velocity at a depth of 90 kilometres, where the blue regions are slow and the red regions are fast. Uh, the yellow dashed lines are outlining different lithospheric domains. And we've got the mineral deposits plotted with circles, and what you can see here is that um, there's a good correlation of uh, the mineral deposits occurring on these domain boundaries or close to them, and very rarely are they occurring within the lithospheric blocks. And so what's happening here is that the, the boundaries of these lithospheric domains um, are likely to be controlling features for the mineral system. So uh, fluid pathways that bring up the, the minerals um, are using these lithospheric scale structures. And obviously the fluids and melts will be electrically conductive, so we can image these with MT. Um, sort of more generally, we're looking to uh, get a better understanding of the tectonic evolution of South Australia, and if we have a whole of lithosphere resistivity model of South Australia, then we've got a great tool to answer various geological questions. So OSLAMP is the Australian Lithospheric Architecture Magnetotelluric Project. It involves 2,800 long period MT sites across Australia in a 55 kilometre space grid. Um, the project should be finished in the next five to six years, and on the figure on the left, the red sites are the completed ones. We leave the instruments out for three weeks, and we get a period range of about 10 to 10,000 seconds. It's a very collaborative project, so in South Australia, that's um, the University of Adelaide, the Geological Survey of South Australia, and Geoscience Australia are working together. Uh, the figure on the right zooms in on South Australia, which is the area we'll, area we'll be speaking about today. Um, and the blue sites are completed here, so South Australia is almost complete. There will be 400 sites in total. And we've got 25 sites still to collect in yellow up the top. And the red sites are sites that still need to be repeated due to poor data quality. So having a look at the data, and for anyone who doesn't know, these are phase tensor ellipses, and I won't go into too much detail about them, but what we're just looking to see is broad scale um, conductivity changes across the state. And I've shaded them with minimum phase angles, so red means the subsurface is becoming more conductive with depth, and blue it's becoming more resistive. And what you can see is we're, we're already noticing very broad scale changes in the conductivity structure, and I'll just point out a couple of these. Um, so in the centre of the Gola Craton, we've got um, sort of these white, uh, narrow ellipses. And then kind of around the margin, but still within the Gola Craton, the ellipses uh, have low phase angle. Moving across to the east into the Akara Flinders Ranges, uh, there's uh, quite a complex um, pattern with the ellipses. And this is an intraplate deformation area. Moving up into the northeast, ellipses uh, don't change a whole lot. Um, low phase angles and then... Uh, to the northwest, we're in the Musgrave province here, and the ellipses um, is where they're uh, more red shaded, um, and that's where we're waiting on a lot of data still. So we modelled the data using MODEM uh, with a horizontal cell size of 10 kilometres by 10 kilometres, and a starting resistivity for this model of 100 ohm metres, a covariance of 0.3. Uh, 23 periods over the range of 10 to 10,000 seconds were inverted, and I think the final RMS was about 2.5. Uh, so at a depth of 150 kilometres, what you can see is it's relatively homogeneous throughout most of the state, which isn't unexpected, um, but there's, there's a couple of standout features. Uh, so first within the Gaula Craton, um, and so in a Craton we'd expect it, as it's an old region, we'd expect it's been depleted, um, and therefore would likely to be imaged uh, as resistive. But we've got this uh, really conductive feature here. It's, a, it's about 50 ohm metres. And then another feature is uh, this R1, which is a lot more resistive than, um, than the rest of the state. We've also got this other uh, conductive feature, C2, um, and that's uh, within the Akara Flinders Ranges. Um, but I'm not going to dwell on that, as I spoke about the Flinders Ranges on my talk on Monday. Um, and we'll sort of focus on the Gola Craton from this model. Uh, shallowing to a depth of 80 kilometres, you can see that we've still got the resistive core of the Gola Craton, 
um, starting to get hint of something a bit conductive coming up in the middle. And now we have this conductive margin sort of feature happening here. And then within the craton, we're reverting back to more resistive, but still not as resistive as this core region. Shallower still, at 30 kilometres, we're in the lower crust. Um, it's a lot, more, uh, a lot more heterogeneity across the state here. Um, particularly along the eastern Gawler Craton and the Flinders Ranges and Kernamona Province. Um, so it's uh, really uh, conductive there and then slightly less conductive, but seems like it might extend around across here. Now, if we plot that same depth slice with uh, the locations of mines, which are shown by the green circles and uh, diamond occurrences, which are in yellow, you can see that there's a correlation of these mines occurring kind of either on uh, the mines and the diamonds occurring either on the conductive regions or on the gradients where we're going from the conductive anomalies to the more resistive type background structure. And so taking a closer look at why we see that correlation, um, so this figure on the left um, is outlining the main uh, mineral provinces within the Gola Craton. So in yellow here, we've got the Olympic Copper Gold Province, and in pink, the Central Gola Gold Province. Um, uh, the red uh, blotches are the uh, Gola Range volcanics, which erupted uh, 15, uh, six, about 1,600 million years ago. Um, and that came along with the mineralisation that we see in the Gawler Craton. Plotted in circles is the epsilon neodymium values, where high values um, show a more, uh, the granites come from a more evolved magma, which has had a lot more crustal interaction on its ascent, and the green colours um, less evolved and little to no crustal interaction. And so what we see is, um, when we look at the uh, Olympic Copper Gold province, uh, we've got a correlation where we've got the, um, as you saw, the, the mines, um, but also the uh, Hiltiver suite and um, the, uh, the more evolved magmas. Then when we go to the central gold province, uh, it's still conductive, which you can't see as well with this colour scale. If I just go back, you can see it's uh, more conductive than the surrounds but not as conductive, so less crustal interaction seems to be correlating with uh, not as conductive correlation with the mineral deposits. Going into the mantle now to interpret the um, Gola, rain, uh, the Gola Craton mantle conductor shown in the green rectangle there. Uh, this figure is showing that we've got an anomalous abundance of fluorine within the Gola Craton, um, specifically within the Hiltiber Suite and the Gola Range Volcanics. Um, if I just go back, uh, the Gawler Range Volcanics are the pink shaded region there, and as I mentioned, the hilt of a suite are the red uh, blotches. Um, so the, the dots uh, showing the hilt of a suite in the Gawler Range Volcanics, um, in uh, the amount of fluorine in parts per million on the y-axis, and the average values for the continental crust, felsic volcanics and granite are these horizontal lines here. And if we had a completely depleted mantle, that's a, uh, the line down the bottom. So what you can see is that throughout the Gawler Range Volcanics and the Hiltiber Suite, we've got um, generally much higher values than average. So we've got a fluorine enrichment. What does that mean in terms of conductivity? Uh, so fluorine is present in phlogopite, and this study is showing the results that uh, phlogopite is really electrically conductive. Um, so the figure on the left has conductivity and inverse temperature, and you can see uh, the values that they obtained for the conductivity of phlogopite is really conductive. And if we compare it to wet olivine, you can see that it's, it's much more conductive than that. Uh, the figure on the right is showing uh, that as you increase the amount of phlogopite, it becomes more conductive. Uh, so what we might be seeing for the mantle conductor is a combination of um, the, pr the presence of phlogopite, which is electrically conductive, and we know that there's uh, well, we have evidence to suggest that there's a hydrogen enrichment as well within the region, so it may be a combination of these two. So we, as you saw in the status map at the start, we do have more data. Um, so this is what we refer to as the northeast model, and at the moment these have been inverted separately and I've just pasted one on top of the other. Um, but we will invert them together probably once we get the rest of the data here. But you can see a couple of new features coming out from this northeast extension. Uh, so first, where we've got this um, conductive margin, you can see that it's actually sort of forking off into two directions there. 
um, and we'd need more data there to see, to constrain that feature better. And then the other thing you can see is that um, it's quite conductive within the middle bit there. And if we zoom in on that, and sorry about the colour change, but uh, again, red is conductive, blue is resistive. Um, so this is the Gawler Craton margin here, and we've got the conductive margin that, that you saw in the previous slide. You can see that when we're leaving the craton, crossing this black line, it's still really resistive. So um, what might I, uh, this is a quite a poorly constrained boundary, so we may still actually be within the Gawler craton here, or if not, then perhaps in some other cratonic or, or depleted, for another reason, uh, region. And then as we cross this line, we've come into a much more conductive part of the model. And this, was, this might be where we're transitioning into the Phanerozoic um, eastern accreted orogenic part of Australia. Uh, taking, I've just seen I've got a minute left, um, looking at a couple of cross sections from the Auslamp model, um, this is down to a depth of 200 kilometres. You can see that it's really conductive within the crust. And this is a slice from the Kernamona province, again, large crustal conductor seeing sort of pervasive fluid alteration in the lower crust. And as you head up towards the surface, we're seeing fluid delivery pathways. Um, and if we were to do higher resolution surveys, um, such as these two that have occurred across mineral known mines, um, then we can see these pathways in a lot higher resolution. So this first one's across the Beverly Uranium Mine, conductive lower crust, and a conductive pathway leading right up to the, to the mine. And these fluids have provided the conditions needed to precipitate out uranium from nearby. And the bottom uh, is a transect across the Olympic Dam IOCG uranium deposit, which is the world's biggest uranium and the fourth biggest copper deposit. So these pathways, this middle pathway is pointing right to Olympic Dam and then to two other IOCG deposits in the region. So we have a tool to image uh, pervasive fluid movement uh, on a finer scale, fluid pathways, and also to get a better understanding of the geological features and perhaps even re-identify craton margins with this model. Um, so there's a lot of people to thank for Auslamp, but I won't dwell on that, and I'll just leave you with the take-home messages because I've gone over time. Thank you for your attention. Okay. I rush for no reason. Apparently, it's a 12-minute no, timer. No, 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 no. You can answer all those wonderful questions. Okay. Do we have wonderful questions? Oh, ladies first. Carol. I'll, re I'll repeat. Yeah, so the question was uh, that she's surprised to see such a uh, low resistivities in a craton region um, because she'd be expected to see it has dried out. Um, so, yeah, so that, that's uh, sort of why we've done this investigation into what might be causing it because it is um, unexpected. It's definitely not an isolated case, though, and it does occur um, throughout the world. So um, it would be very resistive if sort of nothing had happened to the craton since it had formed, but um, if there's been metasomatism, and that could be from subduction or some other type of event, then you will sort of see this enrichment in things like hydrogen or fluorine, which can enhance the conductivity. Yeah, so, um, and I think uh, one thing that I didn't emphasise is that uh, when you see the mineral deposits and, and conductive regions, they're not, while they're on lithospheric scale, stru uh, lithospheric scale structures, it's not necessarily on the boundaries of cratons, um, because sometimes that's not where the big uh, margins are occurring. 
So for instance here we've got shear zones occurring sort of around right where that, those conductive features are and this is sort of the, the region where we're going to see the conductivity not necessarily at the edge of the craton. Okay, thanks. Paul. Thanks. So um, our next talk is going to be about uh, forward modeling real, re realistic uh, structures uh, by Colin and um, Tell me, how, how does this interface go into full screen view? Oh, full screen mode, there we go. Okay, take it away, Colin. Uh, thanks very much. Um, uh, first of all, um, thanks very much for the opportunity to, to tell you something about the work we've been doing up at Memorial University in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, so I mean, we're trying to, we're keen to be developing forward modeling and inversion methods for realistic earth models. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll probably um, understand what I mean by realistic. Essentially, it's to, to be able to sort of work with the geological earth models that people are starting to use these days. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about one particular approach because there's challenges to, to some of this working with uh, realistic earth models. And this is going to be the mesh-free approach. So a little bit at the end about mesh-free approach. Uh, the co-authors here. Uh, Jambo Long is a PhD student with me. He's working on the mesh-free methods. I also have another student doing EM for modeling and inversion, Shushan Lu, and then Peter Luliev, a uh, research associate, uh, who I'm fortunate enough to have working with me. He's done, done a lot of the work, the coding software development for this unstructured mesh uh, software and manipulation tools and inversion tools. Um, however, I realized when I was putting this um, talk together, oops. Thank you. Um, but I'm lifting quite a few images from some other people's work, and including um, my former students, uh, Masood Ansari, Hermoz Jahandari, and uh, Michael Dunham. So thanks very much for their work. Uh, there we go. Uh, OK, so the motivation uh, for this work, and so just lifting some uh, illustrations from the literature, and so you know, we geophysicists are certain not, certainly not the only ones that work with um, com computer models of the subsurface, uh, certainly 3D computer models these days. Uh, so these are just geological, 3D geological um, computer models. Uh, these two images on the right uh, are for a uh, larger scale structure in the Alps, and essentially all the surfaces in here are contacts between different geological units or fault zones. Uh, this is another uh, example from uh, northwestern France, I think, in this blue, the, sorry, this browner surface, whoops, is the topographic surface. The blue and the yellow are contacts between different geological units. Uh, there's a fault plane coming through here, and so on. You know, this is a 3D computer model of the subsurface. Uh, this type of geological earth modeling is very much being driven by the structural geologists. So they are building these models from measurements of strikes and dips on the surface, perhaps down boreholes. Um, essentially doing a geological inverse problem to build these 3D models from geological data. Um, one example from uh, MT data, so there's the sort of the, the 2D MT inversion result that we're all familiar with. Uh, and this, okay, this is not actually a model. Um, this is an interpretation, but it's for the art for this talk here, this could, may, could easily be a, a one of these 3D geological earth models with all these interfaces in here within our 3D geological model of the surface. And you know the geologists, maybe the, the geodynamic people in terms of their geodynamic modeling, uh, are using this as their you know, computer model, computer interpretation of whatever data that we're looking with, not just our EM data, but our other geophysical data and also, also our geological data. So it's been able to work with you know, this kind of model and do our geophysical modeling and inversion. That's what we're interested in doing, developing the, the software and the tools for doing that. Um, one of the ways is using unstructured tetrahedral meshes. And for sure, we are not the only group that has worked on this. So I want to acknowledge um, a number of the other people that have worked, especially in the context of EM, um, Klaus Spitzer's group, Klaus Spitzer's group uh, Ralph Oe Berner, uh, Evan Um, uh, Vladimir Prusirev, uh, Christoph Schwarzbach, originally from uh, Klaus Spitzer's group, uh, Kerry Key uh, and the group at uh, Scripps. So there's quite a lot of people uh, looking at these unstructured tetrahedral grids. Um, 
In terms of just a couple of examples from, from our work, I mean, there's a number of different approaches that you can use for your numerical modeling. This is just an example of the edge element-based um, finite element modeling. This is an image of two tetrahedral cells, one on the left, one on the right. And then if you just have a slice through these two cells and look at what your basis functions are doing across that slice, just to illustrate these basis functions that we're using to build up our electromagnetic fields. Uh, whoops, where is it? Um, this is the scalar basis function across that plane, a value essentially one here and decreasing linearly across that surface. Uh, if you look at various gradients of that, uh, this is the gradient of that um, scalar basis function. So if you're using that scalar basis function for your electric potential and then taking the gradient of that to get your galvanic component of the electric field, then you can get a discontinuous um, component of the electric field across, discontinuous component of the normal um, electric field across that interface. Uh, if you look at the edge element basis functions, if you're wanting to uh, um, approximate the electric field or the, the vector potential, then that's what these look like, and these are going to be continuous across uh, appropriate interfaces and then have no tangential component on other interfaces. So, you know, the finite element method is good for unstructured tetrahedral meshes. It is possible to look at a, essentially a staggered grid finite difference scheme. So this is, again, two tetrahedral cells joined across this face in the middle, so this is the other tetrahedral cell. And if you think of each node in that uh, Delaunay mesh, and think of essentially a beach ball around each node that can give you a Voronoi uh, mesh, geo mesh. And so that just nicely gives you uh, intersecting loops, uh, which you can build sort of typical staggered grid with perhaps the electric field wrapping, <coughs> wrapping around the magnetic field, and then the magnetic field wrapping around your electric field or current density. So yeah, it's totally possible to derive this staggered grid finite difference uh, approach for these unstructured tetrahedral grids. So we can do the EM modeling relatively well. Um, here are just some examples from the work we've done. Um, I mean, our sort of main application, I must admit, is mineral exploration, so slightly uh, smaller models than uh, we've been seeing so far in this session. But this is um, uh, a massive sulfide conductive ore deposit up in uh, Labrador in, in Canada, and this is, uh, it has now been mined, it's been drilled extensively, so we know the shape of it very well. So in terms of this sort of testing case, we know the shape of this conductor zone really well. This is our topography. There is a line of airborne frequency domain EM data across here. This is a cross section through that very conductive ore deposit. This is the refinement in the mesh where we have our transmitter receiver pair flying along. And in this picture here, let's see the dots are the calculated and the lines are the measured. Um, we know the shape very well. We don't really know the connectivities. So we had to play around to get the connectivities to get a decent match, but we were happy with that. Um, you know, this is just you know, the advantages of doing our 3D numerical modeling. We can look inside the model to see what our electric fields are doing. Uh, this is using the scalar vector potential, and so this is a total current density uh, for a transmitter right above the, the center of the ore deposit, and so yes, our nice circular current flow loops. Uh, also, our vertical sections through here showing the induced current, and so yeah, the induced current essentially sitting right on the, the surface of this very conductive ore deposit, doesn't get into the center. Uh, I've also done some modeling of marine CSEM data offshore Newfoundland. Uh, sorry, no scale on this, but this is about uh, five kilometers, six kilometers down here from the blue is the seawater. The red in there is a, the hydrocarbon zone we were modeling, took the interfaces from seismics. Uh, so it's still a pretty simple model because we just had uniform connectivity within each layer. Um, but certainly the interfaces from seismics and so model data on the right. Um, so this is a couple of slices in there. I'm just going to look at the two on the right. So this is that hydrocarbon layer, more resistive in our sedimentary background. And so this is starting to illustrate the issues with um, these unstructured meshes. And so if you just take your interfaces from the seismics and put it into your tetrahedral mesh generator, then you can start getting some pretty ugly looking tetrahedra. So you have to put in extra constraints to get fairly nice tetrahedra that are as close to, as possible to um, sort of isosceles triangles. Uh, if you try and do your EM solver on this kind of a mesh, it's going to struggle or totally fail. So you need to get this quality kind of mesh out. And so this starts to be the problem, the challenge with um, uh, unstructured tetrahedral meshes. This is not any old mesh will do, and it can be really difficult, even if you've got your interfaces from a geological model, to um, uh, generate one of these quality meshes. 
uh, especially if you're joining some of these services together it is all, and, and welding those services to get a watertight uh, join, then it's almost impossible to get nice tetrahedra, and so you need to perhaps do remeshing, which is what these people are doing to get uh, a much nicer distribution of nodes on your surfaces. Um, okay, so the mesh-free method is to try and deal with this challenge. So this is just like a uh, sort of cartoon drawing. This is our geological feature, and we've got these sort of pinch outs where if we're trying to de um, develop a tetrahedral mesh around here, then we have to have lots of small cells in there to make sure that we don't get any long pointy ones. Uh, so this mesh-free method that's looking attractive is can we just distribute a cloud of nodes throughout this model such that that cloud of nodes is not restricted to have to also reproduce the features in the model? And so that's the mesh-free approach. Um, you know, geological feature, schematic geological feature, a cloud of nodes. In some ways, it's really just like a, a finite difference approach where you think of each node as being the center of a, a little sort of subdomain. And so instead of your cells in your model, you're now thinking of this um, subdomain as your sort of pseudo cell for your numerical modeling. Uh, and then you can either do uh, a strong form to develop a, a stencil, find a different stencil, kind of like what you do on a mesh, uh, or you can do uh, integration and averaging to get that sort of, sort of weak form like you would for finite elements. But it is totally possible to set up a uh, a numerical modeling scheme. And this is where you now have a cloud of nodes for the numerical modeling, and then you've got your mesh that you can then be using to describe your model. Uh, and because that mesh no longer needs to be a quality mesh for your numerical modeling, then it can be terrible. This is not sort of the best kind of example. This is going to be the example for which I show you some results, and it is just gravity at the moment. Uh, little, terrible little cube, uh, this our observation locations. So this is just the, the, the cloud of nodes for our mesh-free method. Um, closer spacing, where we want our observations and we need accuracy, closer spacing to where something interesting is happening, but then a coarser distribution elsewhere. Um, not the best picture, I'm sorry, but this is essentially sort of using the, the, the showing the tetrahedra for parameterizing the model, and this does not need to be a quality mesh now. So we've got this separation. Uh, works fine. This is for the, the gravitational potential. Uh, this is for gravity. And let's see that the, the, the symbols are the numerical modeling. The, the line is what it's supposed to be. Um, so yeah, it could be a way to work. Um, so we're trying to do this for EM. Uh, Jambo has got most of the way there, but um, not all the way there yet. Uh, there is a paper uh, by Vitka and Teskin who do this for 2DMT. Um, we're trying to do this for 3D and for controlled, controlled source. Um, gravity is nice and easy. It's just a scale of potential uh, that's continuous. Derivative is continuous. Um, so we need to be able to deal with vector quantities. Uh, also, this business about the discontinuity of our field component. So if our normal component electric field, we know that's discontinuous across an interface over which there's a, a discontinuity in conductivity. Um, so perhaps working with potentials, with our vector potential, uh, continuous, or scalar potential, continuous. Um, so maybe that gives us a way into using the mesh-free approach, and we're trying that. Um, we may have to end up putting nodes on the interfaces and have some special basis functions to deal with the discontinuities. But this is starting to remove some of the advantages of the, the, the mesh-free method, where our cloud of nodes can be totally de decoupled from our mesh describing the model. So. We don't want to do this if we can. Um, then there's this business about controlled source EM, which we want to model, and you know that's a very nice localized source, so we have to be able to take that in. Um, so I'm not showing any EM results. Jimbo's not got it totally working yet. Mostly working, but not good enough, I guess, for me to be showing them here today. So in terms of conclusions, um, we definitely think it's important to be developing software methodology for these real-life type models. Basically, by that, that I mean, um, methods that allow us to do our geophysics on the same kind of 3D earth models that the <coughs> geologists are doing uh, their modeling with. Uh, the finite element, finite volume, stagger grid, finite difference methods, they all can be made to work fine on such meshes. Um, however, it is challenging to get our quality meshes. One way, of course, is to get better at doing that, and there's lots of groups that are working at that. We're trying a little bit ourselves, but not very much. Um, but one sort of enticing method that we're trying to pursue a bit is this, this mesh-free approach to decouple these two meshes so that the unstructured tetrahedral mesh that we're using to describe the model can now be terrible. 
um, and that we've still got our cloud of nodes on which we're doing our numerical modeling. That's it. Thanks Thank very much. You. Terrible message. One quick question, yeah. Okay, in the interest of keeping on time, we'll, uh, we'll move on. Um, our next talk is going to be on Bayesian stuff by uh, Dan Bladder and his colleagues, and Andre and Kerry Key. Are you going to be able to sneak up here? Thank you. Okay, you should be able to control it from there. Take it away. Good morning, everyone. I'm a little bit under the weather, so I apologize. You'll have to bear with me. Um, uh, like uh, Steve said, I'm Daniel, and my uh, collaborators are Anand Ray and Kerry Key. And I'm going to be presenting you the results of a Bayesian model re resolution comparison study that we did comparing MT, CSCM, and airborne TEM. All in 1D, by the way. I realize now that should probably be in the title. So here's the outline. First, I'll provide some motivation, give you a brief primer on Bayesian inversion, and then jump into the results. So um, recent years have seen the rapid rise in popularity of EM methods for imaging shallow geologic structure, which is really exciting. You can image groundwater, hydrocarbons, mineral deposits, um, geothermal resources, etc. There are a lot of EM methods, um, and comparing them is not always easy. So we decided to pick three of the more popular methods, and I'll go over the basics of these methods for those of you who may not be familiar with them. Uh, first, the MT method. This consists of stations cons um, at the surface of the Earth to measure uh, horizontal electric and magnetic fields. It takes advantage of natural variations in Earth's field. Um, and uh, the assumption is usually that these uh, fields are vertical, and so the currents induced are horizontal. Uh, the airborne transient electromagnetic method is similar in some ways and very different in others. Um, it's very different in that you can collect data much more rapidly. You tow a wire under a helicopter through in which you pulse a current, which generates, again, more or less vertical magnetic fields, so the currents are more or less uh, horizontal. Um, but it doesn't have as de a deep a sensitivity as the magnetotelluric method does. And finally, controlled source electromagnetics um, consists of a transmitter at the surface that allows you to generate the fields of an electric dipole in the subsurface. So here you have both horizontal and vertical electric currents and fields. And then you measure that uh, at the surface using electrodes. So comparing these methods is challenging because they're very different from one another. Um, but one of the things that has really kind of held us back in the EM community is the ability to quantitatively estimate their resolving power. And this can be done if you take advantage of Bayesian methods and uh, parallel computation. And I hope the point of this talk is to, to show you that this can be done. So what do I mean by model resolution? I mean getting a good handle on the uncertainty in your model parameters. So in geophysics, we have data, and we have a model of the Earth, and we have a function that links the two. But really, we don't want to predict our data so much as predict our model, because that's the thing we don't know. We would like F inverse, so that we can you know, input our data and output for each of our model parameters an estimate of its true value. But F inverse simply doesn't exist for the vast majority of interesting problems. So we do the next best thing. Oh, and by the way, the reason that is true is because there are just tons of models that can satisfy the data equally well. So we do the next best thing. We run our data through this black box called inversion, and outside the other end comes this magical estimate of each of our model parameters, which kind of seems like we've managed to circumvent this problem of inverse not existing, but we really haven't. Because if you peer inside the black box, what you see is a machinery designed to select just one model out of all of those many models that can fit the data equally well. So where do all these models come from? Why are there so many that can fit the data? Well, it's because we have uncertainty everywhere. Uh, we've got uncertainty in the data. We've got measurement error and noise. We've got limitations in data coverage and data density. We've got uncertainty in the way we choose to parameterize our models, whether we choose to do it in 1D, 2D, or 3D. This study will be in 1D. The kind of model basis functions we choose, whether they have sharp boundaries, smooth boundaries, et cetera. Um, the number of model parameters we choose to use, and the physics. I mean, we're, we're in EM induction, we're governed by the wave, uh, sorry, not the wave equation, by the heat equation, the diffusion equation, similar to a heat equation. So, I mean, that's just going to have an impact on our ability to resolve the model parameters. So this is kind of the classic view, right, that you're looking for this magical model that maps to your data, but that's really not the way to look at it. I think we need to start moving to looking at it this way. We're trying to 
find all the regions of model space that map to the region of data space consistent with my measured data set. And basically trying to understand what is the range of acceptable values for each model parameter that is consistent with the data. So enter Bayesian inversion. The standard inverse toolkit says form an objective function and find a minimum of it. The Bayesian inversion says find a probability density function of all of your model parameters consistent with the data you have measured. The idea being that you, um, instead of finding a minimum of an objective function, you sample from a space of um, acceptable model parameters. And that is basically what the goal of Bayesian, this is basically how Bayesian inversion works. You just sample from this unknown um, probability density function, and then using those samples you've drawn from that distribution, you try and recreate an estimate of the distribution. Well, you might ask, how on earth can you sample from an unknown distribution? It's actually one of the great triumphs of, a plotter, of modern math, applied mathematics, sorry, that this can actually be done. And markup chain Monte Carlo is one of the more powerful methods for doing this. Yeah, but first, a brief primer on Bayes' rule, since all of it kind of relies on this. The way it works is you have prior assumptions and information, and you add in what's called the likelihood, the likelihood term is where you add in information from the data. And the two of them together, I guess the information from the data modifies your prior assumptions to pr produce your a posteriori probabilities. So you're, you're basically allowing the data to modify your prior assumptions. So we use markup chain Monte Carlo, a trans-dimensional variant of that, which basically means that the model space can change, um, the model space dimensionality can change as the, needed by the data. And we use parallel tempering to make it more um, computationally feasible. And you can think of this as just a guided random walk through the model space, where the information and the data is guiding your random walk through model space. All right, let's jump into the results. We uh, tested two different types of models. One would be a conductive layer in a resistive sediments uh, with a resistive basement, and then a resistive layer in conductive sediments with a resistive basement. You might think of the conductive layer model as like an ore body, and the resistive layer model as uh, something analogous to an oil reservoir. And on the right there, which I don't have time to go over in detail, is the all-important information on how we generated our synthetic data. I just want to say that I'm fully aware that this is extremely important. I like to think of your data as a lemon, and the information about the subsurface contained in your data is the juice in the lemon. So, I mean, the way you generate your synthetic data um, really affects how much juice is in the lemon, so to speak, so this really does matter a lot. All right, so what are you seeing here? These plots can take a little um, to get used to. Uh, on the x-axis, you have log 10 resistivity. On the y-axis, you have depth. Colors uh, represent probability density, with warm colors representing high probability density and cooler colors representing low probability density. The red lines from left to right are the fifth and 95th percentiles of the distribution at each depth. So at each depth, what you're looking at is a marginal probability density function for resistivity. Um, what really is important to pay attention to is the distance between the red lines. That tells you basically your uncertainty. It tells you the 90, gives you the 90% credible interval. It's telling you how much the data can constrain the model at that particular depth. And you can see that all three of these methods are doing pretty good at uh, recovering this shallow conductor. Oh, by the way, the dashed line, the black dashed line is the true model. So all three of them are doing a pretty good job of recovering that conductor. The airborne TEM has a little bit of trouble um, determining if it's from the bottom of the conductor or not, but they all seem to, to recover this conductor just fine. If we go a little bit deeper, the airborne TEM is starting to lose resolution. You can kind of see uh, like a little rel relative high there around where the true model is, but it's not, it's, you know, the, the, the distance between the uh, red lines there is uh, really, really wide. And what's really cool here is that the MT and CSEM, you can see that wedge-shaped feature around the, the true model in both cases. That's a quantitative evidence of the conductivity thickness trade-off. So you can either have really thin conductive layers on the left there of the wedge, or you can have thicker, more resistive layers on the right, and they fit the data equally well. This is showing that the markup chain Monte Carlo sampler was fully exploring that, that portion of model space. And if you go to even deeper depths, this is now 1,000 meters, um, the airborne TEM has lost resolution, and the MT and CSEM are, are still doing just fine. But conductivity is not the only thing you can constrain with Bayesian inversion. Really, the sky's the limit. You can also constrain related parameters. So uh, for example, conductance. Um, so what we did here is for each of these um, 
data types, we, we looked at the region, kind of shown in, in light pink here, consistent with a conductive layer. And we just computed the integral of conductivity with depth. And then and did that for each model in the model ensemble, and then computed an estimated PDF from that. And you can see that here for the three data types. I think the airborne TEM has lower resolution, or is less sensitive to conductance primarily because it didn't quite get the bottom of the layer cleanly. But the other two are clearly um, much sharper in con conductance space than they are in conductivity. I, mean, I think you're seeing a spread of maybe four or five Siemens here, whereas the spread in conductivity was about an order of magnitude. You can also do the same thing for pore fluid resistivity. So we have Archie's law there on the left that says that if you know the bulk resistivity of a formation and you know its porosity and that cementation factor M, you can back out the resistivity of the pore fluids. So obviously this was a synthetic study, so we just kind of chose 10% porosity and a cementation factor of two. You would need to get those from well logs or from some other information in a real field data example. But then basically we just kind of picked a depth equivalent or consistent with the conductive layer and use that for row B. For each model uh, in the ensemble, we extracted row B, row sub B, and then just backed out um, the pore fluid resistivity. And what you're seeing there are the results for that. So again, th the true value being in, in uh, the black dashed line. I think what one of the takeaways from this for me is that we really should be thinking of the true values of Earth's parameters in terms of random variables rather than anything deterministic. And basically, so the, the pore fluid resistivity of the true Earth here is just a random draw from one of these distributions. And that is kind of an uncomfortable way of viewing the Earth's properties, but I think it's probably the more accurate way of viewing them given the uncertainties involved. All right, so real quickly, the resistive layer models, the CSCM is doing far better than the MT or the airborne TEM. Um, and then here, this is just an interesting little anecdote of if you put the resistive basement too close, you can't resolve that layer, but if you push the resistive basement down a little bit long, uh, further, yeah, the CSCM has no trouble resolving it at all. All right, so conclusions and future work. Um, Bayesian inverse methods can quantify model parameter uncertainty. I hope we've demonstrated that. And that you can get quantitative uncertainty on related parameters as well. We showed you examples of conductance and pore fluid resistivity, but really um, the, the sky's the limit. I mean, anything that is related to what your model is made of is actually um, fair game. And then do we have any model resolution winners? Um, first, survey cost and efficiency is really important, and a lot of other factors are as well. But from purely a re resolution uh, standpoint, I would say that if you're looking for shallow conductors, um, any of these three methods works. If you're looking for deeper conductors, MT or CSCM is probably the way to go. And then um, if you're looking for resistive layers, CSCM is really the only option. And for future work, I'd like to do some joint Bayesian inversions to kind of quantify the advantage of doing joint inversion and then move to 2D and 3D. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dan. You've left a uh, little time for questions. Any ideas on how you're going to respond to the analysis of three D? Could you repeat the question? Uh, the, the question was, how are we going to extend the analysis to three D? Um, the first answer is that's a big challenge because it's a very computationally expensive method. Um, we do have some ideas about how to do it when your method doesn't have sensitivity over a massive domain. Like I think airborne TEM might be feasible simply because it's you know, it only has a footprint of a few hundred meters in any direction, so you don't exactly need to invert for the entirety of a massive 3D model space each time for each, for each data sounding. For something like MT, this is really, really challenging because MT has an extremely broad sensitivity. So, yeah, that's, it's going to be very hard. But I guess the answer is you have to be very clever about the way you parallelize everything and take advantage of that. Oh. The very first example you showed, I think, was your conductive example. Where uh -huh. This one? Yeah, do you have any comments on why TEM had a... You mean... Oh, you mean the, the resistive upper portion? Yeah, the resistive upper portion, I mean... No, that, that's a really good question. I mean, it could just be the fact that it hasn't completely converged. 
I mean, that's, that's always an issue. And when I was running, you know, like dozens and dozens of inversions trying to get ready for AGU, I didn't run them for as long as I probably would um, in other circumstances. So that could be the answer. Um, or it just could be interesting trade-offs going on. But I, I don't think that that's probably the case. Okay. Thanks. We have to move on. Thanks. Okay, so our next uh, talk is on source bias in MT uh, by Murphy and Egbert, and uh, Benjamin uh, Murphy is going to give the talk. So there's the end of PC, so that all should work. Cool, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, let's just go ahead and get started here. So, um, as I think all of you are probably aware, over the past 10 years or so, the uh, EarthScope program has collected long period data across much of the continental US. And uh, as of two weeks ago, this is what the, um, the footprint looks like. Um, and as we've been going through and working with this data, we've noticed these, maybe, there we go, these um, interesting little narrow band humps here that generally fall between about 10 and 100 seconds in apparent resistivity and phase, as well as in the vertical uh, magnetic field transfer functions. And because, uh, of course, electromagnetic induction of the Earth is a diffusive process, we we know that the transfer function should be nice, smooth functions of period. This is uh, not something that we expect for um, uh, electromagnetic induction in the Earth. And um, when we look at the uh, spatial distribution of sites that show these kind of little humps, this is a map of vertically integrated conductance from a few different um, resistivity models between depths of 15 and 150 kilometers. Um, blue is more resistive. You see these little gray dots are sites that show these little humps. They are generally in areas that uh, display high earth resistivity. Um, and so we hypothesize that these little glitches in the transfer functions are evidence of source bias. Because um, you're all familiar with the skin depth. As you make the earth more resistive, the skin depth becomes large. And if we have a relatively short spatial scale magnetic source field, um, we can start to violate the fundamental quasi-uniform assumption of the MT method. Um, and in the uh, band between 10 and 100 seconds, we know of a magnetospheric process that can introduce um, this kind of bias in our data, and that is uh, field line resonance. Um, and in a magnetic field data, these produce geomagnetic pulsations in the PC3-4 to PC4 band. Um, so in the closed portion of Earth's magnetic field, you can see here, um, the field lines can actually ring kind of like plucking guitar string. Uh, we can establish standing alphane waves on here. And these can be excited by processes, uh, solar wind coupling energy into the magnetopause, into the, and then from there into the magnetosphere. So you can see in this lower right picture here. And mathematically, um, we can uh, model the field line resonance process as a damped driven harmonic oscillator, where the forcing comes from interactions between the solar wind and the Earth's magnetosphere, and the damping comes from the ionosphere. Of course, the field lines are closed, so they come in and are grounded on either side in the ionosphere. And the resonant period for um, the field line resonance is set by field line length, the magnetic field strength along the line, and plasma density. Generally, the field line length is the most important factor, and of course, field lines get longer as you go poleward, so the fundamental period of the resonance will increase as you go towards the poles. Um, field, line resonance of, field line resonances have been studied very extensively in the space physics community. In fact, they like to use them to remotely sense the plasma sphere, and um, they use they look at the amplitude and phase differences between meridionally spaced sites, so that is sites that are on the same line of longitude but at different latitudes. They look at the amplitude and phase differences between those sites to localize the period of the resonance. Um, and that's what these plots down here are showing. Um, because each field line, you know, each, each latitude is associated with a specific field line and therefore with a specific period. So um, two meridionally spaced sites will have slightly different amplitude and phase responses that are um, dependent upon the resonant period. If you look at the differences between the phase and um, amplitude response difference, you get these features here. This specifically, the cross phase, is um, what I'm gonna be talking about shortly and what a lot of space physicists use to um, locate field line resonances. Um, another way to look at this is that um, 
the period, the resonant period is going to change with latitude. And for a specific single period that you want to look at, this is what the phase response would look like as you move up and down in latitude. You can look at the phase difference between sites. And even over, sorry, the um, just 100 or 200 kilometers moving meridionally, there's a significant phase change here. And it's really important to note also that what we're sensing on, in the magnetic fields, at the horizontal magnetic fields at the Earth's surface is not actually directly uh, due to stuff in the magnetosphere, it's actually the ionospheric filtering of the signal. Um, these field lines come in, they're grounded in the ionosphere. We can't sense the field line current part, but we do sense the Hall currents that are moving here in the ionosphere. You can see current going that way, current going this way on either side of the ringing field line, and that's actually what drives the magnetic fields we see at the surface. So really quickly, this is what um, these pulsations look like in our data for magnetic electric fields. Um, and I'm going to show this movie. Yes, Windows is looking out for our safety here. Um, I think this is just cool, so I want to take some time to show it. Um, I'm going to, I'll show it twice. And so this, these are the horizontal magnetic field vectors at the Earth's surface that have been rotated 90 degrees to represent the equivalent ionospheric currents, just right-hand rule. And um, it's been band passed between 10 and 100 seconds. And you can see these nice little dancing arrows here. So let me show it one more time. And the important thing I want you to note is meridionally, here's the pulsation event that is about to start. There's a phase shift going north-south here. You can see there's a little phase lag here. And this is only 200 kilometers. Zonally, things are pretty much the same. It's meridionally that things are different. So that's cool and important, as you will see. So um, what I did is I went through a bunch of uh, the time series from uh, the Earthscope data and calculated the cross phases for sites that are spaced meridionally about 100 or 200 kilometers apart. These two site pairs are located over resistive Earth. These are located over conductive Earth. And you can see in the cross phase, right in the same band where we get these little glitches in our transfer functions, we have nice sharp peaks in the cross phase. Um, these, this, the site pairs that I used for this are located further south geomagnetically, or further equatorward geomagnetically than these sites. And you can see the cross phase here is about 30 seconds. This one's pushing further up to about 50 seconds. And that's consistent going um, further poleward in, in la geomagnetic latitude. We have a longer period um, for the field line resonance. So this, we take this as pretty clear evidence that you know, we've got these field line resonances that are operating they, there's a phase change of you know, 15 degrees here, um, only over about 100, 200 kilometers. And over resistive Earth, that's starting to violate the assumption that we make in the MT method. I also want to note over conductive Earth, you can see here we still have this uh, peak in the cross phase. So field line resonances are still being excited. But over conductive Earth, we don't really cause problems for the transfer functions. And so um, this is a, uh, the out results of using the array processing technique that Gary and Maxim Smirnoff have been working on. This is from the robust array processing uh, PCA analysis. Um, first, take a look at this plot here. This shows you the um, power in different um, data modes um, normalized to estimates of the noise level. So here, and this is in dB, so Zero is kind of the noise floor, and you can see the two, these two red lines represent the two kind of plane wave modes that we think of in MT. And right in this, this is for um, uh, the leftmost of those plots I just showed you. So in the band of about 20 to 30 seconds, same as in that previous plot, you see there's another mode here in the data that rises above the local noise level. And so these are the corresponding spatial modes. Um, these two plane wave modes, the blue arrows are the magnetic fields, red arrows are the electric fields, blue circles are the, represent the um, vertical magnetic fields. So you can see the two plane wave modes. And this is this third significant uh, spatial mode here. You see it's associated with the clear north-south gradient in the horizontal magnetic fields, large vertical magnetic fields, what we'd expect. And you also see to the south here, electric fields going this way, to the north, electric fields going that way exactly what we expect for a field line resonance that's kind of coming in right in the middle of the array there. So 
That's cool. And I want to go back to this picture just to mention again that in general these seem to occur, these gray dots, where we really clearly see evidence for this, generally over resistive portions of the Earth. But there are places here in the western US, you see they generally kind of fall on the edges, actually, of the Medicine Hat Block, one of these resistive Archean cratons. Same thing with the Wyoming craton, the Colorado Plateau. So um, one thing we're planning on doing next is going is um, using ModEM, changing the forcing, and trying to explore what the effect of 3D Earth conductivity is on um, the results in our transfer functions. And you're probably also wondering if it's possible to remove um, these little humps from the data. And so again, this is the uh, same plot I've been showing, shown multiple, several times so far with these little glitches. On the right, what I have done is just gone through, looked at the time series, and marked sections where you can clearly see those nice monochromatic uh, pulsations in our data. And then I reprocessed the time series, leaving out those, or repros yeah, reprocessed things, leaving out those sections of our data. And you can see it does actually a pretty good job of getting rid of some of these little biases, at least in the apparent resistivity and phase. Um, the, tip, the vertical field transfer functions may be still there, but that was a pretty crude way of doing things. You might be able to improve on it and get rid of these little, little bumps. So um, I will give you some conclusions, and you can ask me any questions that you have. But um, first of all, you know, we, we generally only think of source biases affecting our data at really long periods and at high latitudes. But this here you can see that even at mid-latitudes in the continental US and even at kind of short periods, 10, 20, 30 seconds, we can still, um, we can still see the effect of source inhomogeneities in our transfer functions. But as you saw, these are little tiny bumps in the transfer functions. They're, they're clearly visible, but they're probably not going to be a problem for inversions as long as we use appropriate error floors. Although we do want to explore more if, there's, if there are cases where this could be, become a problem. And I think the most important thing to note here is number three that Gary pointed out to me recently is that this is a really good example of why we actually need error floors and inversions. There are these little subtle, subtle biases that we probably don't really think about that often. And it's just in this case, we actually can see it in the data. There might be other cases where we don't really, where it's not just like jumping out at us. So we need to keep in mind that there are things that we don't take into account in all the assumptions that we make in MT. And so error floors are probably necessary for our inversions. And so I will end there and take any questions. Thank you. Well, okay. yeah. Perfect timing, so we have uh, time for a couple of questions. Paul again. No, um, because, <laughs> yeah, I should have, that is something I forgot to mention, is that these are all remote reference estimates, and um, it, it seems like we can't, can't get rid of them because they, they are like a coherent part of the, the signal and in, in the data. Um, and even if they're, and I don't know, Gary might want to comment on this, but even <laughs> if you... <laughs> Yeah, so you're, you're, so Gary, Gary notes that um, it's, it's still coherent, it's just that locally you're getting an enhancement of the signal. So actually there is a, a large scale compressional um, at these periods, there's still a large scale compressional, um, cause you're beating on the magnetosphere, so there is a compressional um, broad scale feature in the magnetic field, it's just that locally you're enhancing the signal. And so I don't think you can remove that effect with robust remote referencing. Alexei. I'm just uh, curious, so whether it's possible to filter out uh, this effect by using the cross uh, uh, EG remote? That is a really good question. question. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, he was asking if it's possible to use these, uh, like I showed, the, the two modes from the PCA analysis to take those and create transfer functions that would filter out this effect. And that might be possible. Um, I haven't really played it with it too much. I think Gary has played with it a little bit, and maybe you can do something. But yeah, that is something that we should look at more as a potential solution to get around this problem. OK, thank you. We need yep. to move on. So, our next talk, um, 
is on uh, massive sulfide exploration, and it's given by uh, Romina German and uh, a host of colleagues. Um, here you are. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> That's right. I'm going to present some interdisciplinary results. Stop it. So we have sound. There we are. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Um, <coughs> from the Blue Mining Project, which is a deep sea mining project from, uh, funded by the European Union. So there, um, um, I want to especially acknowledge my colleagues Sebastian Hulz and Amir Haroun from um, Geoma, who's been working with the TEM data analysis that I'm going to show. Then I also would like to acknowledge the, the group uh, around um, Sven Peterson, so Florian Sitzka, Sebastian Graber, and Isabel Yeo, who's done the, the bathymetry analysis and the magnetics and the self potential. And I would like to acknowledge Al Bagil, who's, who's done the uh, seismic exp OBS analysis, and Lawrence North for the rock sample analysis. And then, of course, thanks for um, the supervisors and the PIs, especially Brem Merton. So the study is in a uh, transatlantic geotraverse area, which is just four days from south of the Azores, right here. So there has been a lot of studies in this area because there's um, so there's, uh, um, there's hydrothermal deposits found on the sea floor and uh, an active mount as well. So there are a lot of studies right there. And this is a study from De Martin et al, which shows like a micro seismicity and a an, uh, refraction experiment, so seismic tomography results. So there is some, this is a neovolcanic zone, this is a spreading ridge, and then we have some elevated uh, velocities right here next to it underneath these hydrothermal deposits. When you look at the at the uh, micro seismicity, you get these uh, um, strong like accumulations here, which are related to um, a faulting. And so we have some faults there where we think the hydrothermal fluids are coming from seven kilometers depth here. So they come, they are enriched down here in the weak zone. They're very hot and uh, come to the surface, and then there's a little bit of a rollover to a. Um, for the, for the fold, and so and we can see actually the fold intersect in the sea floor right there. But then the fluids they come up earlier, they go vertically, and so they um, they cool down at the they, uh, precip they precipitate the minerals again, and then these minerals like build up on e each other, and then they form these mounds. Okay, so this is a um, study from the tuck mount from the IODP drilling. So they, they found there's these massive sulfides, most, mostly pyrites, iron rich on the top when there's the energy brexia underneath and then we have this wall rock down here where there's a lot of uh, silica precipitated and there's this chlorinized basalt. So there's this, uh, these hydrothermal fluids that alter the, the basaltic crust to a great, great extent. So if you do a resistivity model from that, you, um, you get these high um, uh, or low resistivities, high conductivities on the top where the sulfides are and then you get, these, um, um, you get these veins, which are intermediately resistive, and then we have very, like the mostly resistive, this is like about 10 ohm meters here for the basaltic crust underneath. So here I need to point out that these, um, these seismic velocities actually are, are high in the sulfides and also in the root. So there's a contrast between the velocities and the resistivities here. So this is our um, survey design. So this is a bathymetry data result from uh, AOV, so 19 AOV dives. So they were from 20 to 100 meter uh, height. So two meter resolution to 50 centimeters resolution. Very nice, so you can see this, this whole um, terrain here which is uh, highly faulted and there's a lot of hummocky uh, mounds, so there's a lot of volcanic activity as well. So um, these mounds, especially like around here where we put all our instruments, so we have these um, the OBSs and the hydrophones, which are, which are about here. We put a lot of them on the mounts itself. And then we have the um, OBM receivers from, from Guillaume, which are, which are positioned along here and along here. So, so um, and down here is the active tag mount to a few there. Okay, so um, one experiment, electromagnetic experiment I'm, I'm gonna talk about is the, the Guillaume experiment. Um, with just a, a coil system. So this is an um, inductive system, which is sensitive to conductive material in, underneath. And it's been used a lot on land, but at sea, it's, it's, um, it's not as much. And that's due to the conductive seawater and the dissipating fields. And so this has to be like five meters above the ground. We were still towing it, which was quite nice. So we were doing these transects and towing it, trying to t stay five meters above the ground. 
So this um, and they then should have like a very nice response here. So there we turn the it's a time domain system. So you turn the current on, turn it off, and then look at the at the at the um, at the voltage. And so we have if there is a sulfide deposit here, there would be a um, a slower decline of these these currents here uh, of these voltages here. So, and this is actually a data example here. This is a, um, the red curve here is a data example just above one of these sulfide deposits and the one the underneath the basalt. So you can see actually it's very nicely this difference. So then they, they used a, a technique from uh, Smilinski and Weiss to, to calculate apparent resistivities. And so they used, the, this is for example for eight milliseconds here, somewhere here, uh, where they used um, this formula to calculate apparent resistivities. And you see these are the two mounts this is the three mount region that I'm going to show a lot today. So this is uh, the one of the mounts, and this is another one, and uh, up, up here is another one as well. So they, they all show higher conductivities. So then the second experiment I'm going to show, going to talk about, is uh, from the University of Southampton. So it's the active source. It's a dipole, um, a dipole here. So it has uh, inductive and and galvanic um, um, con conduction here. And so we have these fields dissipating in the seafloor, and they're recorded with the three axial um, re receivers uh, in, um, in the back. We had one at 350 and one in uh, 500 meters offset. And so we, we induced a, um, a waveform, like of 90 amperes, as a square waveform that can then be recorded on the uh, cross line, on the, on the in line, and on the, on the vertical. And we've seen that these are, espe like especially the vertical uh, fields, are quite sensitive to, to what's happening underneath. So these are the inlines, which are relatively smooth for different frequencies. So the solid lines is one hertz, our base frequencies. And then the dashed lines are three hertz and five, and five hertz. So you can see the verticals are actually going, going uh, are very sensitive to this sub sea floor. So this is the, this is the sea floor, and this is our toe right here, so we were about 50 to 150 meters above the sea floor. It's a, um, and it's a bit tricky to tow this, of course, above the sea floor without, uh, without hitting any, anything, and so we were quite careful, and therefore when we went over the mounts, we noticed the altitude was changing. The drivers were also getting nervous, and they, they, they pulled up the instrument a bit, which then caused, like this is the dip of the transmitter, which caused a change of the dip of the transmitter from five to minus five degrees, so, or the other way around, yeah. So, and this, uh, that it didn't affect the, the receivers as much, but this actually, this, um, this change in the, in, the, um, in the dip then has a huge effect on the, on the Z component again. So we in, included a lot of like this into, into our error estimation for the, for the survey to, do the, to run the inversions properly. And so we also like did some 3D modeling to compare, so this is the results from, from Amir. And I uh, want to show like this is a, this this is like a, just a simple cone model where we have the towing the transmitter on top. So this is a basalt underneath, and then there is this cone which is one uh, conductive and one resistive. So and then we subtract the two. So this was the conductive one and the resistive one. We subtract the two, and then we show like where is it most sensitive to the inline and to the vertical component. And so this is the source, and it seems like the mo the highest sensitivity here is actually on the sea floor for, for the mount and not where we towed it. So if we, but if we look for the vertical, we see the sensitivity is actually quite, quite good um, where we towed it. So this explains more also why this component is so sensitive to the, to the sulfides. So, all right, and we also did some, um, we did some inversions with um, Mari2DM from Kerry and uh, we saw that if we have like this 3D feature and so with 3D data that we invert with 2D, we get a lot of features here. We get like very um, resistive stuff underneath the mounts. So this is for conductive mounts. So the mount is okay, but then we have a lot of features around it. So just to keep that in mind as well. The data is also doesn't fit as well. So you get a lot of systematic error here. So you, uh, you, your, your results are biased or the, the errors are biased. So that also needs to be taken into account. Okay, so these are inversion results for one, one, one frequency only. And uh, this, is, um, this is a transect between these mounts that I've shown before. So this is uh, what we call Shinkai and Southern Mount here. And there's a third mount as well that, they found, um, that we found later on also with, with a little ROV. Um, so that's, that's confirmed. And so these, these are conductivities here from one to uh, six Siemens per meter. So for the first 100 meters. So, it, so I tried to, 
get an idea like how I plot this on a, on a 2D map. So that's why I weighted them with the sensitivity. So sensitivities are plotted on top here, so where it's all blended out, there's no sensitivity for these areas down here. So we pretty much have sensitivity the first 150 to 200 meters with the instrument. So then I multiplied these, and there's actually a, high, a very high sensitivity to these mount regions. So I get this, um, this red line here, which, sh which is mo ma mainly sh shows these mounts, which is nice. So then the data also, the residuals look quite fine after we adjusted the arrow and everything. So that's good. So I wanted to compare that now to the magnetic data. So we here, this is a reduced to the pole, so the magnetic lows are actually there where we, where, we expect, uh, where we expect them, where the target should be, and they, they are magnetic lows because the, the, the basalt is altered and the titano mag, uh, magnetite has uh, moved to be titano magnetite. So and that's, um, and that's why we, we expect these lows actually underneath these, um, these um, deposits as well. Then we compared them to the seismic as well. So we had, this is the results from, from, from ALBA. And there, from that, we get these, um, boundar like these, these boundaries, these, refle um, these reflective boundaries here. And we can see the, the con uh, conductors are actually on the top while the seismic see the whole root of the mount. Yeah. So, and this is the, the map view. So these are the, um, in the background is the, the bathymetry. Then we have the magnetic map on top. So the magnetic lows are in blue. And you can see these large like areas where we have magnetic lows, where we assume there was a lot of hydrothermal circulation in these areas. And along that, we see a lot of mounds as well. And a lot of, like, we have these conductive anomalies as well. And this is the active side, like the active tack mount. And there's a lot of things happening here as well. So then. Um, want to go a little faster. So the three mount area, I want to show some, these are self potentials. So these um, sulfide deposits, they actually have like a um, response them, them, themselves. They, have, they build up charge themselves, which can be measured. So we see this at these mounts, Shinkai, Southern, and Double. And then these results are from, from the TM survey. So these are 1D inversions underneath the mounts. So just uh, very nicely uh, conductive under, just underneath the mounts. And then the, we, we put them together with the, um, with the results from, um, from the CSCM and from the, from the seismic. And these are uh, borehole samples. So these are all, the, the, the circles are all um, samples, so sulfide samples. And they have uh, high velocities above four, four kilometers per second. And they have um, low, uh, no, yeah, low resistivities here. While these are the basalt samples, which are on the other side. So therefore, we try to like estimate like where are actually our sulfide deposits, and it, yeah, should should be in this area. So this needs to be confirmed like with the geological model and the geochemical model, of course. And then yeah, that's uh, I would like to acknowledge the um, the European Union's seventh framework program, um, Horizon 2020, and uh, all of the the ship crew and all of the participants. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Rumi. We've got time for a question or two. Kerry. Yeah, um, so on your uh, CD inversion plot, you have some high connectivity to the mounds work, but it looks like there's also a lot of high connectivity um, outside the region to the mounds. So are those like these are just failed to fit with mounds, but that's still up in the rotation right now? Or is it like a straight line there? Yeah, because the, this, if you look at these results here, where we include more, that we included more frequencies, we get rid of a lot of these features. So a lot, of, a lot more components um, in actually get rid of uh, these features, which we assume might be due to navigational errors or due to, um, or just to assuming a, a 2D environment where it's actually 3D. I mean, there, the changes in 50 meters over 100 meters or something. There are large changes in topography. Okay. We will roll on. Thank you, Ramina. Thank you. <coughs> so the next talk is going to be given by me and my colleague here, Phil, will make sure that I keep to time, um, along with some colleagues from Ocean Floor Geophysics, Peter Kowalczyk and uh, Steve Bloomer. And um, so I'm going to talk about um, using marine self-potential and controlled source EM measurements uh, using an autonomous underwater vehicle and as we saw in uh, Ramina's talk, um, the area, the, the, the target of interest is uh, seafloor massive sulfides and, uh, and hydrothermal 
systems. So um, there's a lot of interest uh, currently uh, in this sort of geology and uh, these, the, the, um, these, the standard approaches are to try and measure self-potential or connectivity using CSEM, using, using deep-toed instruments. Um, um, I use a laser pointer. Um, and so um, the, the idea of using marine self-potential for massive sulfides dates back to the mid-70s with, uh, with Corwin, um, but uh, um, the, uh, the, the, the interest is, uh, is, is mostly current at this point. Um, as Ramina explained, uh, they have a, uh, a vertical TEM system and they can put self-potential electrodes on the frame to make those measurements. Um, there are a couple of Japanese deep-toed uh, self-potential systems and uh, we have also developed a deep-toed controlled source EM system, the Vulcan system that uh, Ramina showed you some results from. All, all these systems use uh, cables from a ship uh, to tow the systems around and that uh, means that the, the tow speeds have got to be uh, kept below about two knots. Um, the turns are inefficient because you have to lift the system off the seafloor during turns. Uh, navigation is challenging because uh, um, the thing is behind the ship somewhere. Um, and in particular, um, the cables moving sideways through the Earth's magnetic field can create uh, a Lorentz V cross B signal that uh, can contaminate your self-potential. So um, this led us to uh, try something different. Um, and, um, the idea is to uh, mount the uh, receiver uh, system on an autonomous underwater vehicle and then deploy battery-powered transmitters on the seafloor to transmit controlled source EM system uh, signals to the, to the receiver. And this frees up the ship to do whatever else it wants. And navigation is pretty good because the AUV is loaded with inertial navigation and um, short baseline acoustics and bottom tracking and so on. Um, and uh, the AUV can also collect self-potential measurements um, and it's also collecting a lot of other information such as uh, bathymetry, side scan sonar, magnetometry, water chemistry and so on. So it's a nice multi-sensor package. Uh, we're not the first to do this. Um, um, just uh, in October 2015, the Jamstec group uh, put uh, self-potential uh, uh, systems on their uh, AUV um, and uh, got some nice results doing that. But as far as we know, we're the first uh, group to actually uh, use uh, uh, an AUV for a CSEM system. So we had we had the battery-powered transmitters. We've had uh, we've been we've been we developed these some years ago. Um, we basically s fill a pressure case full of batteries uh, and put it on something that looks like one of our seafloor receivers, except now the electrodes are big copper pipes, and you can uh, deploy this. It'll sit on the seafloor. It uh, transmits about 25 amps for uh, a couple of hours, and the nice thing here is you can, you can alternate between the two polarizations, so you can, you can generate two modes of uh, electric field. So all we needed was an AUV, um, and we, uh, we teamed up with Fukada Marine Works uh, to put uh, electrodes and, and recording systems on their, on their AUV. Um, so we're measure, measuring in line along these two electrode pairs here, cross line, and you'll later on see we also can include a vertical. Um, and so in October 2015, we carried out a proof of concept. The noise, the big question was, what is the noise of an AUV? The answer is horrible. Um, there's lots of very narrow band uh, noise associated with the propulsion system, um, but this is predictable. It's dependent on speed, um, but uh, we can predict where it is. So we can choose our CSEM frequencies to um, lie in the gaps between these noise peaks. And so um, using the noise we measured, we could predict what the controlled source um, noise would be, and a model study suggested that uh, it was acceptable. So um, last year, in October, um, again with help from Fukada, um, we rigged up uh, their AUV again um, and uh, took along some of our battery-powered, two, two battery, well, three, 
battery-powered transmitters, um, and uh, did a survey in an area in the Okinawa, Okinawa Trough um, where there are uh, known hydrothermal systems. Um, so we, uh, <coughs> we deployed two of the doozy transmitters, we call our doozy deployed undersea electromagnetic source instrument. Um, it's supposed to be a joke. Um, and then uh, um, flew 20 AUV lines in a orthogonal pattern over the survey area. Um, the AUV was at an altitude of 70 meters and was flying at about uh, a little over a meter per second. Um, we, we, we flew repeat lines because this being the first time we'd done this, we wanted to see what the data uh, repeatability was uh, going to be like. Um, I, it's worth pointing out that the entire operation, the deployment of the transmitters, the flying of the AUV, and the recovery of the transmitters took less than one 24-hour day of ship time. So this is a very efficient way of collecting data. The self-potential data here for three lines, I think that these three lines here, um, are, are they're very reproducible. Um, the data errors are somewhere around 10 microvolts per meter. Um, and so we were pretty pleased with the, that data quality. Um, here's the entire self-potential data set averaged over 30-second windows. Um, this is the component in the north south, nor northeast southwest direction. This is the component in the southeast northwest direction. And this is the component in the vertical direction. So the signals here are of the order um, half a millivolt per meter full scale. So they're not large, but you can see from the line-to-line -line reproducibility here that we actually do, do have a nice signal. Um, so it's, it's sort of nice to convert these discrete data into a map. Um, one way to do this is to use a favorite scheme of mine, Occam inversion. We can create a smooth surface um, based on noisy, unevenly displaced data where we just cast the forward problem. The forward problem is linear. In fact, it's just the measurement. Um, so this is the vertical field um, mapped out. Um, and you can see that there are three regions of increased vertical self-potential uh, here, A, B, and C. If we compare that to bathymetry, we can see that this is, these are associated, the A and B signals are associated with these seafloor um, mounds uh, that have been mapped in the, uh, this is the bathymetry generated by the AUV. Um, we'd like to convert the electric field we measure to actual self-potential uh, normally, this would be done by integrating the electric field, uh, but with, again, with, uh, with noisy, unevenly spaced, sometimes repetitive data, that's a tricky numerical calculation. So um, we can do it another way. We can just cast it as a forward problem where we take the differences in the potential to approximate the electric fields and then invert that, uh, of course, using with Occam. Um, and so if we, if we put an evenly spaced mesh of potentials on a grid, uh, we, can, we can approximate the, uh, the electric fields we measure in terms of the differences. And the only data manipulation that we need to do here is to rotate the measurements from the AUV frame of reference into uh, an X and Y component, uh, although I guess I could have rotated the model frame as well. Um, and if we do this, uh, we, we, we recover a negative self-potential anomaly of about 30 millivolts, um, um, again, uh, centered on this mound A, but also mound B, and then a broader area of negative self-potential up in, up in this area here. Um, the, uh, the arrows on this plot here are the actual measurements uh, of the electric field vectors uh, made by the, uh, the AUV. Actually, this is potential difference, not uh, electric field, so it points uphill rather than downhill. Um, we can model uh, this. We can we can model the uh, electric fields that we measured in terms of uh, um, poles or dipoles, uh, and it, when you do that, um, the poles lie very close to the seafloor. So these we're flying at a height of 70 meters. These 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 signals are of order 70 meters wide, um, and so just from potential field theory, we know that the 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 source of this signal is close to the seafloor. The uh, positive return poles to balance current. Uh, must be about a uh, kilo kilometer deep or, or deeper. Uh, and this is just to prove that we fit the data, but of course it's a linear system, so that's not too hard. Um, moving on to the controlled source EM, um, 
the, um, the, the two transmitters um, transmitted a modified square wave, which gives us a, a broader spectrum of uh, signals than a, than, a, than a simple square wave. Um, and we, uh, we did a trick where we, where we transmitted at slightly different frequencies so that we could actually run the two transmitters at the same time. Um, and, uh, but to hedge our bets, we did have periods where we were, we were, we were this, is, this is doozy three only, doozy three and doozy four, and doozy four only. Um, so far, we've only gone as far as con uh, um, apparent conductivities, and we do this by modeling the entire geometry of the transmitter receiver system for various half spaces, and then just do a data interpolation to turn these into apparent conductivities. Um, and here's the result overlain on bathymetry. Um, this is for the two polarizations of uh, Doozy 4. Um, these are apparent conductivities from um, 0 0.3 Siemens per meter to 30 Siemens per meter. Uh, Seawater's uh, green on this, uh, on this color scale. Um, and the little black lines, again, show the actual orientation of the electric field. So um, I, I sort of really enjoyed this, having spent years doing marine CSEM. This is the first time I've actually been able to see the geometry of the dipole field uh, splayed out here. So what we see is some very high apparent conductivities, uh, 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 more than 10 Siemens per meter in the area of the uh, um, southern mound. Uh, high conductivities, but not quite as high in the area of the uh, northern mound, and things that are more, con more appropriate with uh, for resistive basalt in, in this area here. Uh, the, the slight difference between these two uh, polarizations is to be expected given the very different sensitivities of the two modes for various structure. So in conclusion, um, we think that AUVs are uh, a very efficient way of making uh, CSEM and uh, uh, self-potential measurements. Um, our Self-potential noise floor was below 10 microvolts per meter, which is uh, um, uh, uh, very nice, and we, uh, we recovered a self-potential of two, a few tens of millivolts. Um, we see large apparent conductivities um, associated with these seafloor mounds. Um, so uh, um, in combination, uh, that suggests that uh, there are seafloor massive sulfides associated uh, with these mounds. Um, and um, I'd like to... Thank all the people that helped make this work, especially Fukada, who allowed us to strap um, weird equipment to their $10 million AUV. Thank you. Well, we have time for a couple. Uh, yeah, well, I, um, actually, I've done the calculation for the V cross B noise, um, and uh, it's, um, be it's, it's below our noise floor. And actually, um, so the, um, the inline is no problem. Um, it, it, it turns out that be be because of the um, nature of the flight pattern, um, we, were, we were not coupled uh, strongly to the, to the magnetic field. So... Um, it, uh, um, it, we, we, we've, this, this paper's in, re, in review, and I actually have a calculation. I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but, uh, but we did consider the, the V cross B component, because, of course, that's the problem with these long cables, um, which I... And streaming potentials, I guess, Yeah, I don't believe in streaming potentials in the marine environment. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so... Don't forget to come back here at uh, 10.20 for the next uh, Frontiers of Electromagnetic Methods ses uh, 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 session. Um, so, uh, you know, get your coffee, but do come back. <laughs>